Damn. So it's the Christmas season and Adam Cool essentially just dropped us a bombshell. It's our greatest Christmas gift yet. And do pardon my surrounding. I've very quickly watched um, Adam's video and this is basically just my own perspective on how things are playing out right now in China today. Quick summary of what Adam said in his latest video. For Adam, um, he basically professed that he has had enough of the Chinese government. Um, I think a lot of people have been hopeful about the entire Chinese reopening story, um, about the lifting of some of these pandemic restrictions, and more importantly, um, the stopping or the halting of this entire tech crackdown episode. So the last straw was really this idea of flip-flopping in some of this governmental action. Because we did see that it was a surprise attack on the recent gaming industry. Uh, and they essentially drafted new regulations and saying that, oh, um, this was not in line with what uh, many inv international investors were thinking about where they said that um, they've done enough um, to regulate many of these industries. And you can see that uh, the market essentially reacted very, very negatively. Um, Net ease was down 20 over percent, Tencent was down more than 12-15%. So it was a flip-flopping in this so-called um, perceived idea of where the Chinese government sits with some of this uh, companies today. On the second point, it's about the Chinese government placing interests of their people over businesses. And they are also willing to sacrifice businesses without blinking their eyes. Thirdly, I think underlying this entire discussion, um, he talks about investing in China stocks is very tempting because both fundamentals and valuations perspective, they are very, very attractive. But um, I think he has decided to pull the trigger to basically sell out his entire 10 cent position. It makes up less than 1% of his whole portfolio and the entire Chinese equity exposure makes up less than 4%. And he's also looking to exit most of his Chinese position in time to come when valuation rebounds and he's basically looking at it from a technical perspective. Now, um, he then rotated on to talk about um, the criteria to sell. Uh, mostly, it's not due to very short-term temporary issues, but more so um, structural problems with the company. So he didn't really sell out of his Chinese position because of the economy being weak. Um, he did so because of the structural policies that are not pro-business. And to supplement the point, um, the government is not only restricting some of these gaming units, um, they are essentially restricting growth in general. So, and I quote, all video games must put a cap on how much players can top up their accounts and alert users about irrational consumption behavior via a pop-up window. So then, um, I think the entire thesis or the entire essence of the video was that Adam very much prefers to make money where um, it's easy to make. And he highlighted this entire point of predictability. And the US market, in comparison, when compared to the Chinese market or Chinese counterparts, a lot more predictable and a lot easier to benefit from um, the entire equity space. It has been outperforming the market over the last five years or so, um, even if you include in the Chinese position. So he really did um, benefit greatly essentially shifted his mindset and that's why he decided to say enough is enough he's not interested in Chinese equities anymore and since he knows how to play the game in the US market he will proceed on to do so so I think for myself I'll just give probably three broad strokes or three broad ideas um, these are not very very refined thoughts um, I might make a follow-up video again so it actually revolves around three piece so the first point is actually perceived flip-flopping so I think it's true that a lot of investors were very hopeful particularly so the international investors thinking that hey there's a reversal in sentiments and there's some sort of a normalization in terms of specifically this tech and education crackdown but clearly um, the entire gaming industry is still under very, very strict regulations. So the funny thing is, actually, if you really think about it, I do not remember that the government officially coming out to make a statement that, hey, um, they're going to prioritize uh, relieving some of this tech crackdown and say that, yeah, guys, uh, we are done with this whole issue and we are no longer going to crack down. I think it's true to a certain extent that the government said that they wanted to reprioritize growth. They wanted to reprioritize some of this um, investment-led growth in the technology industry. But they did not make the claim that, hey, guys, um, I'm no longer going to touch the tech industry and the gaming industry and whatnot. So that's just one point. It's really this idea of what you perceive and what is actuality. And at least from the Chinese government's perspective, they didn't go back on their word on anything. But then again, it comes back down to what you think of it as an investor. Because as an investor, um, you wouldn't want uh, so many surprise elements in your investing and to basically screw up many of your valuations and many of your models and many of your expectations. So I guess this is a really a very strong and compelling point for people to say that, okay, the Chinese market is too much for me. But I think I will kind of 
counter it in a sense where if you really look at the regulation history of how the Chinese regulators have been conducting themselves, there is actually a pattern. So I think there's a very interesting tweet from Lillian. She basically said that in the US, um, they basically don't regulate. In the EU, they regulate and then don't innovate because um, there are too many restrictions and companies basically don't have a lot of ways to maneuver. And specifically for China, they innovate and then regulate. So if you look at many of the other past episodes of tech crackdowns and regulations, they will come in and then they will start um, regulating and trying to put in measures and rules to make sure that um, the companies play by it and to make it a much more level playing field. So at least if we were to follow um, based on past track record and history, um, that's presumably my own assumption as well, where um, I don't know how long this entire tech crackdown episode will last, but Hopefully, um, we are much closer to the end of the tunnel. Uh, but of course, uh, some of you or naysayers might argue that, hey, um, they might continuously, perpetually um, regulate all the way. And I think on this part, specifically on industries like gaming, which is a little bit more sensitive because they want to protect the use and, and the productivity of the economy, etc. Um, it might permanently be under strict regulations, but I don't think they are able to keep up the pace and the cadence, which allows for the companies to also maneuver and to kind of adapt to the new regulations as well. So it might be in periods of high intensity and then low intensity. But I think in the grander scheme of things, I think many of the companies, uh, specifically those that I'm betting on or those that I have a vested interest in, I do think that they have the capability, they have the talent to kind of still have the ability to find for new market, new opportunities to also grow their business. And I think in Tencent's case, you can see that their international gaming arm is kind of uh, taking a much larger and larger pie while the domestic games actually slow down. Uh, what's the impact? I think we will have to see uh, how things are playing out. Weibo has recently introduced a method that will help us take away our emotions from the picture. So you can now automate your investments via their regular savings plan to help you save both time and energy for things that matter in your life. So Weibo's regular savings plan currently supports US listed stocks, ETF, and SGD USD denominated mutual funds. So Weibo's RSP is really a game changer for passive investors that wants to automate their investment process yet stay disciplined in making their money work harder for them. So here's how you do it. All you need to do is to choose a US stock, ETF, or mutual fund, set the amount to invest, select your payment method, and the frequency of each interval. Simple as that. And that is how you continue to build your portfolio automatically. So Weibo has also since increased their Money Bull campaign rewards. So for new users that has yet to participate in their previous rounds, they've lowered the requirements to depositing an accumulated amount of at least 2,000 US dollars and have since increased the cash vouchers for the highest qualifying tier to 3,000 US dollars. So for those without a Weibo account today, I don't know what you're waiting for. Sign up with the link below now. Thank you Weibo for sponsoring this video. On the second P, it's actually this idea of predictability. US market is much more predictable. Don't waste your time in the emerging markets. But the funny thing is, we do see this sort of um, dispersion, a uh, disparity in uh, performance. There are times where the US market, the advanced economies will underperform the emerging economies. The idea of having a legitimate predictability pattern is because there is a long-standing track record at least from my own perspective, that oh, people are going to keep pulling out the chart of the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ over the last 50, 100 years and say that, oh, everything just goes um, 45 degrees to the right. And because you see that there's a 100 years track record, everything just seems to go up. That's why um, it's very, very predictable. But I think the basis of this predictability, because it seems to me when I speak to many other investors, they try to validate or they try to substantiate the argument by tossing out a few very common factors. And if you may allow me to list it, they say that, oh, the US market has the strongest or one of the strongest rule of law. But this is not the basis for stocks going up because if you are to look, I think my home country, Singapore, we have a very strong system in upholding rule of law as well. But look at our stock market, it hasn't been performing, which is the Straits Time Index. And then some people might say that, oh, um, the US is very pro-business. Um, they, they, they allow for the entrepreneurship spirit to flourish. But if you really take a look, I'm sure there's enough academias or academics research being done and there are even indexes being created to say pro-business a country is and if you were to take a look 
I think the US might not even be in the top three or top five. Of course, they have their own set of criteria. We are not here to debate whether the indexes are useful or not. But what I'm trying to say is there are a lot of other countries that are also very, very pro-business, but the stock market doesn't seem to perform as well. So if you were to ask me what is my personal opinion, I think if you look at many of these factors, we shouldn't look at it in silo. But I think it's the unique blend in contributing factors, um, history, culture, that really allowed for this exceptionalism in the US to prosper. And that's why it translated to a stock market outperformance for such a long period of time. But the key question here is this, how long will it continue outperforming and will it ever end? I think these are the two biggest questions, um, specifically for passive investors that buy into index funds and more so um, those that just index into like the S&P 500 or the QQQ because they presumably uh, made the assessment that, hey, this is my assumption, the US stock market they will continue to outperform. I don't need other geographic exposure. So I think these are just very valid questions to ask yourself. And really, there isn't a simple answer to many of these assumptions. So that's the point on predictability. And the last P, it's really problems. So problems around investing into the Chinese um, stock market today. So a lot of people have been commenting on the sidelines also saying that, oh, you're gambling or you're speculating or you're punting with Chinese stocks right now. Whoever touch Chinese stocks, um, you guys are basically gamblers. Um, I feel that that's a very bold statement to make because you're basically claiming that every investor that touches Chinese stocks, um, he or she is a gambler. So of course, we know many famous investors like Charlie Munger, Buffett, Howard Marks, they all probably have Chinese exposure as well. So I probably wouldn't categorize them as a gambler, but that's just a food for thought. And pivoting over to this idea of unpredictability, there is this element of surprise that many investors are very uncomfortable with um, the Chinese market because a Chinese a regulator or a Chinese government can come out today with a new regulation. They are going to pass it through law because nobody is going to be opposing against it. And then, ta-da! Um, your companies are going to get hit. But at least for my own observation, so if you compare it with any governments in the world, the Chinese government is probably one of the best in terms of executing on basically everything that they set forth every five years through their five-year plan. And that's quite an irony, don't you think? For somebody that claims that I mean, it's extremely unpredictable, you don't know what the government is expecting or installing ahead. So that's that. I think government intervention in itself is very real. It's a very real concern and risk. So we need to take into account those uh, elements of surprise in our models, in our um, analysis. But it does not mean that it is entirely a black box to us. And I understand that many people would say that, oh, why would you want to take the challenging road when there's clearly a much easier path by investing into the US market? So I think back to this idea of risk, I think a lot of things are perceived. Perceived in the way where the assessment is made by using backward-looking metrics because, like I said, you look at the US market, it's up for the last 100 years. You look at the Chinese market, the Singapore market, it didn't go anywhere. But I would still like to emphasize that, hey, um, the risk ahead is completely unknown. Nobody is guaranteeing the returns that you get by investing in a US broad-based index fund like the S&P 500. You can backtest as many data as you want. Yes, many people are publishing the statistics of 8 to 10% per annum, but nobody dare to claim or guarantee that that 7 to 10% of performance in the long run is going to come into fruition. I think the entire idea of this 8 to 10% performance per annum being guaranteed and being risk-free, it's a very, very dangerous mindset and a very dangerous knowledge that's being spread around many people. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. So I think that's also just another food for thought for people that are standing on the other side of the aisle. So I think, uh, of course, last but not least, uh, just some key observations and maybe my own personal action. So I think for those of you who haven't been following, um, this new gaming regulation that basically broke the news just on Friday alone, uh, that I also made a recent video on, actually these are just regulations that are drafted. So the regulators are currently seeking public comments until the January of 22nd. Number one, we don't have the details. We don't know by how much they're doing it. I, I believe investors around the world are basically just selling down first. Um, we sell first and then we talk later. So that's basically the mindset right now. And circling back to the video that Adam just did, I went to briefly just scroll through the comments. I think it's really, really very interesting. We have extreme polarity. We have polar opposite views with many likes um, supporting each side of the camp. You have people that say that, oh, um, Adam has finally paper handed. They've sh shaked off weak hands and the bottom is probably near. On the other hand, a lot of people are saying that, oh, I've told you so. Um, the Chinese regulation that came in two, three years ago, why would you even believe the Chinese government? No investors is willing to take on the risk. Nobody's going to trust the gov Chinese government anymore. But the funny thing is people often forget that this idea of trust, it's a very malleable subject. Um, I still feel that capital only seeks out for itself, meaning capital only wants to grow capital or wants to grow itself. 
And this entire idea of nobody trusting the Chinese government since the dawn of time. Um, the funny thing is, uh, Chairman Xi, he's in his third term now, so he's in, been in power for the last 10 decade or more. For those of you who have forgotten or seem to have forgotten, um, Baba and Tencent both reached their all-time highs just three, four years back. Same government, same structure. Uh, maybe you can argue that, hey, um, Chairman Xi is basically controlling China, the entirety of China, because they swap out people and stuff like that. Uh, but let's not forget that it's still a very complex structure. It's a very complex system. Interesting dichotomy that when you are making the claim that Chairman Xi is going to destroy everything. So I think for myself, I've accumulated my fair share of Chinese stocks and they do make up a very significant portion of my portfolio right now. I think at least 60 to 70%. So I'm constantly trying to quote unquote rebalance it by adding new funds to it and to other opportunities that I see. And I'm not restricting myself to just the US market. I actually did bought a Europe company which is LVMH recently. I made a past video on it. So if you're interested, you can take a look. So unless there's some sort of seismic change in the Chinese landscape, um, I do still see a lot of value in them. I'm probably not going to continue accumulating them at current valuations. But let's say if there's a very lopsided risk reward, who knows, I might include or I might add again. So that's just my own um, two cents on it. So I do believe that right now, I see a lot of value and I see a lot of fear in the Chinese market. And I think blood is truly on the streets now. So yeah, I think with that, um, I'll see you guys in the next video. And yeah, it's a really, really crazy place right now. If I can show you guys, it's so crowded. But yeah, I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.